Okay. Welcome, everybody. I think we're going to get started. It's right at seven, so you'll have to forgive me. I'm going to try to admit people while I'm also talking. So if I stop, um, it's not your screen freezing. It's probably just me freezing while I do two things at the same time. Um, welcome. Thank you for being here. I'm Kelly Bierman. I'm Conservation Director for Nineveh Foundation. And I'm going to hand it over to our guest speaker, Bridget, soon. Um, but I'd like to do one short introduction, if I can. And again, forgive me if I pause while I'm um, chatting, while I admit people. Um, but I just wanted to quickly mention for the folks in the room who may not be familiar with Nineveh Foundation, um, I just wanted to introduce it. We're a small nonprofit conservation organization with a mission dedicated to promoting wilderness and wildlife habitat, as well as providing opportunities for outdoor recreation and education here in Vermont. Uh, Nineveh Foundation cl is closely affiliated with Farm and Wilderness, also a nonprofit summer camp organization providing outdoor experiential education for youth ages four through 17 since 1939. Both organizations are linked closely together in a mission dedicated to environmental stewardship and collectively manage over 5,000 acres of conserved land in Mount Holly and Plymouth, Vermont. Um, just gonna admit this person. If you are, um, just a quick mention, along with the rest of the events in this series, Nineveh Foundation is providing it free of charge and we do rely heavily on charitable donations. So if you do um, have the means and would like to, we'd love um, a donation if you like this event um, and would like to support future events. Um, or if you want to provide a donation for a scholarship for a camper to come to Farm and Wilderness Camp um, this summer, that would be very much appreciated, but by no means, no pressure. Um, quick housekeeping, um, just keep your mics, mics on mute for the duration of the talk. If you do have questions or comments, please put them in the chat. I will be monitoring the chat for Bridget. And if it's a really relevant question, I will definitely um, flag her down and we'll pause to um, answer it. Otherwise, we will be having a, um, at the end, we'll have some Q&A um, time as well. So if we don't get to your question right away, we'll try to answer it then. Um, and then finally, I just really wanna thank Bridget for being here tonight and providing this awesome talk, which I am very excited to join you in listening to. Um, I've had the pleasure of taking um, some of Bridget's um, classes already and they're wonderful. Um, so I really hope you enjoy this and I hope you will check out um, her website as well. Um, she has some great offerings. And I'll put all of the information for Bridget and um, the organizations in the chat as well in case you want the website or my email if you have any questions as well. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Bridget for our talk tonight. Thank you so much, Kelly. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with all of you tonight um, sharing the premiere of this talk. This is really exciting to be sharing this um, for the first time with all of you. Something that I've been thinking about a lot over the past, oh, I don't know, five or eight years or so, and then even more so now that we are in a pandemic. And we'll talk a little bit about that just a smidgen tonight here and there, I'm sure, as we move through the presentation. Um, so I'm curious uh, how many of you, and you can use the chat box, how many of you have been on a bird walk before? And you could just type yes in the chat box or raise your hand if you got your video on, that works too. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, how many of you keep a bird list? Oh, look at that, yes, yes, no. And we have a couple no's, good. All right, that's all right too. All right, how about a bird list? Do you keep a bird list? Okay. All right, no list yet. There we go, it says Dawn. Yes to walk, no to list, okay. How many of you meditate? I'm curious about that. Anybody meditate? Good, all right, yes, yes. Okay, we got some yeses sometimes. Okay, 
good bird watching is meditation victoria you're right there with me okay and that's like my cue to share my screen so let's pull up our presentation for tonight and Kit, thank you so much for watching the chat box because i can't see it now and we will get started so tonight's talk is um called birding and wellness and like i said to you it is brand new um, and I'm excited to share some of the things that I've learned. So by no means am I a mental health expert um, at all. And so some of this, uh, actually all of this are things that I started to ask questions about as I was thinking about how I was changing my birding practice and what my birding practice could do for me other than build a list or build my knowledge. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about my story and my, my, the evolution of my practice a little bit later. But tonight, these are some of the things that we're going to talk about and cover. Um, like Kelly said, if you have any questions that relate to what we're talking about, um, she'll grab, grab those and um, stop me so that we can incorporate those into the conversation. So tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about biophilia, the biophilia hypothesis. We're going to talk about existing in our sensory brain and how we can do a better job of being in that space. Um, we'll talk about soothing and social, why birds are soothing and why they actually help us become more social. Um, we'll talk about birds as a path to mindfulness for the yoga or meditation averse, which is me. I struggled with that just a little bit. And then how to tap into the healing powers with birds. I want to leave you with some action things that you can do and try um, this weekend and as we move through the winter time, especially. All right, so here we go. So one of my, I've got a lot of quotes peppered through this talk because I, I find quotes can be very inspiring and I hold on to them in little booklets and snippets here and there. So this one is a great one to kick off with. The sun rises, the sun falls, the wind blows, and the birds sing no matter where you are. These are experiences that unite us all, something that we can all enjoy together. And that's from um, Five Birds on a Wire by author Melanie Charlene. So one of the things that I really love about birds is they're kind of everywhere. And so there's something that we can all experience Nature is a little bit harder to be in touch with sometimes for those of us, especially those of us who might live in more urban areas or outside of a state like Vermont. But nature is very important to our, well, to our well-being and our soul, I think. E.O. Wilson wrote this great book called Biophilia um, back in 1986. And later there was another book in 1996 that came out that was written by a group of uh, different authors and researchers called the biophilia hypothesis. E.O. Wilson wasn't the first to um, coin the term biophilia, but he defined it as the innate tendency in human beings to focus on life and lifelike process. And he says it suggests that when human beings remove themselves from the natural environment, the biophilic learning rules are not replaced by modern versions. In fact, in an essay that he wrote in 1996, he goes on to say that cognitive psychologists have been strangely slow to address the mental consequences of being detached from the natural environment, and that psychologists and others really should consider biophilia in a more urgent matter because the natural environment is disappearing. Luckily, here in Vermont, we're actually seeing um, more uh, unfragmented forests across our landscape. We're doing a great job of protecting um, the landscape that we love so much here, but that's not quite the case in other places. And we know that with birds, songbird numbers are, are declining um, and they're declining precipitously, especially in the face of climate change. But I, in fact, with what E.O. You know, Wilson saying about psychologists kind of being left behind, what's really great is we're in this place kind of since the late 90s and early 2000s where I feel like we're finally catching up, especially in the past five years. There's been a lot of different stories out there. You've probably seen them in your feeds, maybe on Facebook or on the news, even in the New York Times, that have been about why our connection to nature is so very 
important for our health and well being. And in my opinion, birds are a huge part of that connection. And here are the reasons why I think birds are such a great way to connect to nature um, and kind of refresh and restore ourselves. So birds are kind of everywhere. So they're ubiquitous. They're all over the place. I've got a picture of a rock pigeon here, right? You can be out in the woods and experience birds. We feel like we have to go into these different pristine habitats to be able to experience nature. But even in an urban setting, I think of rock pigeons and house sparrows as two birds that we can observe, watch, and connect with um, in a very simple way. The second part that I think really allows us to connect with birds easily is they really tap into our curiosity. There are so, I mean, right, for one, they fly. You can't ignore that at all. Just the fact that they are able to fly and we aren't is magical in and of itself. But as you start to notice and wonder about the different things that you are noticing, there's so much more there. In the picture that you can see here right in the middle, this is a hooded merganser. It's a male and it's doing a display for the female. So popping up out of the water and stretching its wings and totally fully unfurling that crest on its head so that it looks absolutely magnificent. And if that doesn't make you ask more questions, I, I probably have a couple other bird examples that I could give you that would. The other thing is that birds are very sensory. And one of the ways that we can really restore ourselves and bring ourselves uh, a, a new sense of energy is by tapping into our senses. And we're gonna talk about that tonight. You know, birds' vocalizations, um, their colors, their behaviors, their flight patterns, all of that are eye-catching or ear-catching. And so they provide us with a really easy platform to kind of open up our awareness and improve our skills. Let's talk about a couple of things that kind of emerge when we think about and when researchers talk about what nature can do for us in terms of mental health. And we can apply that to birds a little bit. So there are two themes that kept popping out as I started to dig a little bit deeper and read different articles and research papers. And the two things had to do with cognitive function and stress response. So cognitive function refers to brain-based skills which are needed in acquisition of knowledge, manipulation of information, and for reasoning. It's really what allows us to be focused and productive when we're in a really good state. The other thing is stress response, and I'm sure some of you are experiencing this um, or have experienced this through the pandemic. We've got, I feel like there's like two different layers of stress. There was like pre-pandemic stress and then there's pandemic stress. Um, and we know from um, some of the research that we're finding right now that different environmental organizations are doing, especially the birding organizations, we're seeing a lot more people find an interest in birding um, during the pandemic and that they're using it as a way to cope and decrease their stress. So stress includes physical and thought responses to your perception of various situations. When the stress response is turned on, your body may release some substances like adrenaline and cortisol. And what's really great about spending time with birds is both of these things, cognitive function can be improved and our stress levels can decrease. And I'm sure some of you have experienced that already. Yes, I can see people nodding their heads, really good. And maybe your birding practice has changed since the pandemic, right? Like maybe it's become even more important to you. I know it has to me. So really being in a natural setting, there are, I mean, I could just, I could throw studies at you all night and I don't want to do that because I really kind of want to get into some of the things that we can do that will help us um, through our connection with birds. But being in a natural set setting, even for just 15 minutes, can do a number of different things. It can increase our ability to solve puzzles. It improves our cognition and our attention span. If you measured your blood pressure and your pulse, those would be improved as well. I think of some of the times when I have had, I've experienced anxiety during this pandemic, and I don't think I could ever 
say that. I can't pinpoint another time in my life when I can say, yep, that was an anxiety attack or that was something that was really intense. Stress, definitely, but not the level of anxiety that I felt during this pandemic. And the thing that has really helped me is to remember that I can step outside my door and I can take a deep breath and I can take a break and the birds will call me into awareness. It has been such a saving grace during this time. So in a way, what we're experiencing is something called attention restoration therapy. So this was a theory that was developed by Rachel and Stephen Kaplan in the 1980s, and it only began being researched by the scientific community and tested this whole theory um, in the 90s. And the idea is that people can concentrate better after spending time in nature, or this is amazing, even looking at pictures. So they've done a lot of different studies where they've taken folks and shown them different images, played different audio clips, things like that for them inside and gotten similar results to what you experience when you're outdoors. Of course, it's much better if you go outside and you spend more time outside. Even the amount of time that you spend outside, if you take a larger dose of nature, then you're going to have a better result. And what's fascinating now is in some um, in some states in the United States and in, in some European countries, there are actually there are doctors that are actually prescribing time in the outdoors in order to help with depression and anxiety. So, whether you watch birds from inside or you pack up and head outside, you are giving yourself a chance to recharge mentally. And we've known this for a really long time. I am so enjoying, I mean, the one thing that I've gotten out of the pandemic is just a smidgen more time to read or the need to read and reconnect in that way. And I've been going back and reading actually a lot of um, female, about or a lot of female naturalists and ornithologists. And um, Florence Miriam Bailey was actually uh, friends with John Burroughs. So John Burroughs is, um, a naturalist, and he wrote a book called Time and Change in 1912, and you probably have heard this before, right? I go to nature to be soothed and healed and to have my senses put in order. I think I need to put that on my refrigerator. That would go right next to Mary Oliver's quote about attention being our greatest work. So, I know that I feel that way. And what's great, my scientific brain loves it now that there's research that is backing this up. So let's talk a little bit about the bird effect. This is what's really great when we start to break down why birds, not just nature, but why birds um, can be so beneficial to our health and how we can turn our birding practice just with a few tweaks here and there into something that will be really good for us. So what birds end up doing that I've learned is that they actually pull us out of this one part of our brain called the executive network part of our brain. It's kind of that left side of the brain, the super analytical side. It's the part that's intellectual and task focused. And what they do is they call us to attention and allow us to be in the parts of our brain that produce empathy, creativity, and insight. So that sensory pull pulls all these other things out of us that are really good for our health. So in effect, it's really giving our brain a chance to recover. So if we think about all the things that we're bombarded with on a day-to-day -day basis, especially now in the time of social media. I'm like, I can see like four or five different people on my screen right now. And so I'm curious if you raise your hand, if you find yourself getting sucked into the news a little bit too much lately, and you're trying to like put down the phone. I have a new rule in my house. The phone does not come into the bedroom. It gets plugged in outside of the bedroom. That is like a sacred space where I can shut my brain off unless I'm going outside is the other place. But really what starts to happen is when we're outside and we're pulled more into this sensory place, it's tapping into something that's very deep in us primally. That's what na that where nature is letting us know that this is an easy environment, an easy place, a place that we have come from. And it gives our brain a chance to recover. 
So it's restorative. And what's really cool about that is it then allows us to be more productive. I think a lot about the past week as I was putting this presentation together and I've got piles of books laid out and all these articles pulled up and I'm like, how am I going to tease all this down? And I can feel this, you know, pressure crunching starting to come in. And what I do is I get up and I go outside, take a walk and come back. Um, and it's really great how it allows you to kind of let go and then coming back inside feeling refreshed and productive. So currently right now, there are multiple studies that point to this fact that taking a break outside during your workday, and if you're a school kid or a college kid, um, getting outside during school is really important. And we can see that in some of the work that's actually being done all across Vermont with forest preschools in different areas, which is really wonderful. I think we live in a state that is very connected to the outdoors and nature. Um, and so some of this just seems very natural to us. And at the same time, in my experience over the past year, I feel like I've been able to lean in on my connection with nature a little bit more to kind of help me get through some of the tougher times. For someone who doesn't do any serious birding, would you mind uh, simply identifying what we're looking at here? Yes, totally. And I got to tell you, sometimes it doesn't matter. This is a great thing, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, about mindfulness and birding. So one of the reasons why I picked all these different um, pictures were these birds evoked uh, a sensory connection to me. So let's see if I can turn on a big arrow here. I got my mouse. I'm going to grab a drawing tool, and it's hopefully. So this one right here, oh, that's pretty good. Can you see the pink? Arrow. So the one in the upper left corner, this is a uh, American woodcock. It's kind of a upland shorebird esque type of bird. Um, I love this bird because when I do get a chance to see it, it does these great aerial displays at dusk in the springtime. It does um, a woodcock boogie. It it kind of bobs and bounces back and forth in order to feed and press on the ground. So there's that really cool visual behavior, and they have a great voice. They go peep, peep, they sound like frogs. So that it was the other part that really captured me. The next bird, um, this one right here, and maybe I just need a drawing tool. Let's grab something like that. So um, this one right here, this is white-throated sparrow. This is the song of the Northwoods. This bird is really known as a forest species and sings just this glorious whistled song. Poor Sam, peabody, 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 but it's a gorgeous, gorgeous whistle. Black Bernie and Warbler is the bright orange one right here. That one's called the Flame Throat. Bam, you can tell from that bird, that bright orange bird. These guys are really tricky to see. They're up in the treetops, but when you do, it's like eye candy. It's just absolutely beautiful. Here's that hooded merganser again that I was telling you about. This bird and a lot of waterfowl I enjoy immensely because of the colors and the patterns and the almost textured patterns on their plumage. Really gorgeous birds. And then of course, barred owl. I asked my husband, I was like, I, I, I've got this big spot for one more picture. What do I put in there? And he's like, you gotta put an owl in there because everybody loves owls. Everybody loves an owl. And they tie in to culture and mystery. You know, they're, they're birds of the night. There's so much richness there. They're magnificent to see. And they have great calls too, right? <coughs> So hearing that elicits wonder and curiosity and awe, which we're gonna talk about in just a little bit. Thomas, thanks for the great question. I gotta erase all my doodles, otherwise they'll show up on the next slide. So I just gave you the owl call, of the call of the barred owl there. And the next thing, if I can get my mouse back there, that we're going to talk about a little bit are bird sounds, right? So we were talking about how birds are great because they have this sensory kind of attraction. They tap into all of our senses, almost all of them. 
Um, although I will say smell, scent with a particularly shorebirds, sometimes you get a good scent from shorebird colonies. So maybe they'll play into your sense of smell. But uh, acoustically and visually are the things that birds uh, kind of use to grab us. So what is your ear for soothing sounds? One of the cool things that came out of the book, The Nature Fix by Florence Williams, and I have this in an end slide so that you can see it. These are some of the resources that I relied on heavily. This is a great book all about the science behind how nature is good for us and how it is like getting a fix. It can be almost compared to a drug. So she says in this book, it's thought that birdsong has similarities to human made music and its range and technical wizardry might on some unconscious level stimulate our happy music neurons in our brain. So what researchers have discovered is just by playing birdsong or spending time in nature and listening to birdsong, you can decrease some of the severity of depression you can increase attention restoration and decrease stress. So these are all the things that we were just talking about with cognitive functions and also with stress. So one of the cool things that has happened is that we've started to really test this a little bit more. Currently, there's this woman at the University of Surrey. Her name is Dr. Eleanor Radcliffe. She's been studying the effects of bird song on people. And she says that it all depends, depends on a couple of things, depends on the bird, and it depends on the person and the person's experience with birds and um, nature. So she has a couple of theories about why bird song affects us the way that it does. She says one theory is that it's genetically built into our preference for nature, that biophilia piece, that nature sounds may actually signal that there's food, water, plants, and animal resources nearby. And that makes us feel safer as if we can thrive. So our body naturally goes into a more relaxed state when we hear soothing nature sounds. The other is that nature helps us overcome tiredness as it's an easy and pleasant thing to do. Um, she talks about how like if you work in an office or man, I think about being a mom and being at home and having to cancel out certain sounds of the arguing that's going on and letting that arguing just kind of play out, right? And listening or focusing on whatever else I have to do, that's exhausting. Your brain is working in two different ways. It actually takes energy to cancel out a sound and listen to other things. So same thing in a work environment. We used to think that it was really good to work in these big open spaces and everybody's like working together and it was great because you could have all these conversations, but no wonder you came home from work so tired because you were constantly trying to suppress certain conversations so that you could have your own or you could work on your own work. So are you guys ready? Kelly, this is where I'm gonna try to pull out the chat box again. So I see Thomas has got earphones on. This is gonna be great for you. If you don't have earphones on, turn up your speakers a little bit. We're gonna play a little game. I have three different audio sounds for you. And I'm so curious how this is gonna work out because this is the same thing that uh, Dr. Radcliffe is doing right now. She basically has been doing research and I'm trying to figure out how I'm gonna open the chat here so I can see people's responses. Here we go. Um, she is basically looking at, there we go, I got it. She's basically um, playing audio for people, different little audio snippets, and, and then either asking them how it makes them feel or what kind of response it elicits or storytelling it elicits and capturing that. Um, and so that's what I'd like to do with you right now. So I'm going to play you three different sounds. I'm going to tell you what they are afterwards. And in the chat box, I just want you to say whether it's soothing or annoying. <laughs> so is it something you like or something you dislike? Okay. And then we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. All right. Let's see if I can get this first sound up. Is everybody ready? Good. We got some thumbs up. All right. Here we go. All right, we got stuff coming in already. 
All right, Ruth is like, no. <laughs> soothing, soothing, soothing. Most people are saying soothing. Peaceful twilight. Oh, Victoria is like even like connecting it with a memory. Like this reminds me of, that's awesome, annoying. Okay, good. So, and this is really interesting. Too high a pitch. Okay, awesome. There's a moment of dissonance. Good, I love that. But otherwise, okay. Husband says it's annoying. <laughs> All right, good. So this is really interesting. I, um, I was really having a hard time figuring out which birds to pick. Now I could have picked Robin, American Robin, Cheerio, cheery me, cheerio. It's that like nice, fluty, lilty thing. And I knew kind of what answers I would probably get. Oh, good, Jan, winsome, etheric. Okay, good, soothing but high. Okay, fabulous. So this is, anybody know what this is? I'm gonna wait. Feels like I'm in the woods of New England in the summer. Yes, Freya, awesome, thrush, good. All right, Herm, bam, Jan, you guys are on it. Jan and Victoria make a good team. So you're right, this is our friend the hermit thrush. This is a Vermont state bird, in fact, if you are from Vermont. And if you have been in the east, right, woodlands, dusk, dawn, right, all of those things. What's fascinating about this song, right, and you guys picked up on it. So it was discovered that hermit thrush songs are harmonic intervals that are in pitches that are recognizable to the human ear, which in turn makes them interpreted by most people as pleasant. I think that they're more pleasant to people who have had an experience with them in the Northeast, in the woodlands where you will find them. Um, my dog likes it, Ruth, awesome. So. There you go, right? If the dog likes it, it's doing something good for the dog. It's decreasing those stress levels and uh, making the dog feel better too. So what's fascinating and what I started to think about with this one is there are dissonant notes. You know, thrushes use their um, syrinx to harmonize with themselves. So they're actually playing multiple notes at the same time. Um, and it does have a high pitch as well. Although studies have shown that people actually prefer higher pitch, more melodious sounds um, than they do others. Okay, let's play the next one. We're gonna see what you think of this one. trying not to make my face do anything. That's not really fair. So hopefully you are listening and not looking soothing, entertaining. Okay, funny. That's funny. Closer to irritating, hearing a fight. Funny. Makes me happy. Oh gosh, this is like not what I expected. Okay. And maybe it's because of some of my experiences with this bird. See, I need to go do my own research. Reminds me of my kids arguing. <laughs> Yay, Katie. Busy, irritating, annoying maybe more than one bird, a mimic on speed. So this is more than one bird. It's multiple birds. This is European starling. I can see how you would think it, it's funny, comical. It's almost, they're super chatty, right? So some of the studies have shown that birds in the corvid and blackbird family are in, are interpreted as um, not particularly restorative. It's not a sound that you would want to sit down and just be like, okay, and now it's time to relax and do some breathing exercises. They have more harsh dissonant tones that don't really appeal to the human ear. And it's really funny because in my notes, I say, but try, because these birds, even the ones with the, the annoying dissonant sounds have a gift, have something, some little nugget in there to give you, whether it's the behavior associated with that sound or not. But I get it. I don't think I would wanna hang out and listen to starlings as a way to relax. All right. 
this okay so you gotta i hope you guys have the chat open because there's some funny stuff popping up in here um european starlings can basically beatbox in fact freya i think you're right there's um gosh who was it and i wish i could remember the artist who has kind of teased them apart and done that with them jan says here the backyard birder guy donald krudzma who caught a starling imitating a college student yelling out the dorm window that's the other really beautiful thing about different species of birds is that they're able to mimic each other and so really if we take the time to slow down and listen to some of these birds it's going to take our brain away to this other place where we're starting to wonder and be more curious and in turn that is more relaxing and restorative for us so allowing those things to happen is really good. Okay, last one, here we go. Great, we've got lots of comments coming back here. Best bird call ever, beautiful. Sounds like an alarm, haunting. Listen to all these great descriptive words that you're using. Camping, solitary experience. Tucked inside your sleeping bag. Preternatural, good, good. All right. Could be soothing, but has a little bit of an edge, right? Okay, and it could be creepy too, right? Because if you don't have the experience with it, if it's a novelty and a new sound, then you're like, ooh, I'm not really sure what that is. Great. All right. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. There we go. So this is more of a soundscape, and this is some of the types of things that I've been getting into a little bit more, rather than allowing my brain to sing, single out a bird song or call, I have been starting to train my brain when I go out to listen to the entire soundscape and to listen to the blending and orchestral sound of a natural soundscape. And what's really cool about this is that this can actually hit the trifecta of soothing sounds. And that trifecta from research is, anybody wanna guess? I'm looking at the chat box. Birds is definitely in there. What else is where the loons are? Water, yes, Katie, nice. And the other one begins with a W too. <laughs> Sand bugs, probably not. Wind, yes, Dawn, awesome. So wind, water, and birds are the trifecta of soothing sounds. Those are the three things that came up over and over again in the research for what people preferred. So think lake, pond, ocean, wetland. I even think river and babbling brook sound. Think about that. So when we think about visiting those habitats, those are the places that provide us with that kind of arc of sound that really helps ground us and connect us. It's why folks gravitate towards living near the water. It's part view shed and part soundscape that really makes the place make us feel good. So what's cool about this now is that there are actually airports and schools and hospitals that now play bird song because studies have shown that it, in, it improves mood and mental alertness. So five minutes a day apparently is all it takes to, to be able to take in sound in a way that will calm and calm you and be restorative. Tony saying wilderness. Yeah, that's another good W as well. Super, thanks for playing you guys. All right, I gotta just close chat box here. All right, so I'm gonna ask you to do something else now. So I want you to think for a minute of an awesome moment that you've had with a bird. And I want you to try to recall as many details as possible. Were you alone? 
What was the day like? How did you feel? Maybe you knew the bird. Maybe you didn't know the bird. Maybe you went out looking for the bird. Maybe this was something that just happened. Okay. So really think about how you feel. And the reason why I underlined awe in this sentence, in that word, is because awe is a core positive emotion that goes along with joy, contentment, compassion, pride, love, and amusement. And awe has the ability to change a person's perspective for a long time and sometimes when it's really, really awesome for an entire lifetime. So I wanna tell you one of my awesome bird stories and these other two components about why finding moments of awe or being open to moments of awe is so good for us as human beings. So this really cool duck up in the corner here, this is called a tufted duck. Now, I was up on Lake Carmi, which is a small inland lake on the northern end of Vermont, pretty close to the Canadian border, and I was birding by myself, and I was just out looking for some ducks, and that was my target species, and I had my scope and my binoculars, and uh, I pulled into this parking lot and I noticed a whole bunch, a nice raft of ducks. And as I'm looking through them, I'm like, oh, there's a ring neck duck and there are some mallards and there were some mergansers. And then this one duck kept popping up and diving and popping up and diving again. And it looked like it had seaweed stuck off the back of his head. And I kept going, what's wrong with that bird? Like, why has he got stuff stuck on the back of his head and I kept watching and kept noticing and the seaweed wasn't coming off and the bird was super active so I was like that's not seaweed that's a feather and my mind said tufted duck and I had no experience with a tufted duck at all and so my mind also said that's not normally around here you should look carefully so as I'm doing that a storm is rolling across the lake and it's starting to rain and the rain is hitting the front of my scope and I can't get a good look and I don't have a good camera to put up against my scope to try to get a picture and so I'm panicking and my heart rate is going up and I'm like oh my gosh this could be a really cool find and I don't know if I'm gonna see it but this is amazing and I kept trying to stare at it and then that sheet of rain came across and I had to get back into my car and I was so excited and so just like, I, do I have enough information in my head? And I just started scribbling down notes and I flipping through the book and I couldn't believe that my subconscious brain picked up on that, but it was the shape that told me that it was something different. So I had this awesome moment. Like I could feel all those emotions again, just telling you the story, right? And so this awesome moment led to the next picture. So I didn't get a picture, but I put a word out to all my friends in the birding community. And luckily the next day, a friend got a picture and Charlotte, this woman called me and was like, come on, we're all going up to the lake to see if we can find the tufted duck again. And so I met a bunch of friends and we went and we looked again for this tufted duck. Now we dipped on the duck, which means we didn't see it. But we saw a bunch of other birds and we were really happy and excited to be together, as you can see in that picture. I think Charlotte saw another duck that she hadn't out ever seen before. And so this awesome moment is just a great example of these two things that awe does to us. So in awe-inspiring moments tend to be full of new information. And what that does is that not totally in my case, but they can quiet the body so that you can process what it's experiencing. And I think what that means is, is that everything else gets set aside that's churning around, that's gerbil wheeling in your brain when you allow yourself to be in an awesome moment. And so this, this can sometimes then lead to feelings of empathy and compassion. For me, it was, why is this duck here? Where is it supposed to be? Why is it off track? What else can I know about it? And that led to, th that's curiosity, right? And when you're curious, 
your anxiety decreases and you end up with a sense of well-being. And that novelty that it brings to you is can also be like a little rush. The other cool thing about awe is it also um, tends to push us to make social connections. So if you think about when you have a really cool moment, it could be with birds, it could be with anything, this desire to share, to call someone up, to text someone. I mean, Instagram is a perfect example of this. We're always capturing these little moments and putting them up there and telling the story so that we can get people to connect with us and say, oh, yes, I heart that, I like that, I get that. I, I've had that happen to me before. So what's even more amazing, and I didn't know this, and this is the thing that is so heartbreaking about COVID is that social connections are actually shown to lower stress and lower inflammation. So in your body, those social connections are helping you release certain things. And what's great about birding is there's a whole community of people out there that are experiencing these different connections with birds that we in turn can connect with and share these moments with. So awesomeness from birds is another piece that really helps us connect and release. And you know, the other piece of this, now that I think about it, is awe inspires action as well. And we think about, Kelly, your work with the Nineveh Foundation and the conservation work that you do, this whole series is called the Conservation Series, right? This is the first of many talks. And really our curiosity leads us to empathy and to compassion and it makes us ripe for taking action. So there we go. Birds are that magical spark. Here's something else to consider. This is one of my favorite quotes when I teach um, my slow birding classes. This is from um, Shunryu Suzuki um, from a piece that he wrote called Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. And it says, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, but in the experts, there are few. I think one of the most difficult things within the birding community is this desire to push and to know more and be an expert, to have the, the biggest list, to be the top person on eBird, um, to have a big year and, and be able to accumulate more species than anyone else. And really, I have found that when I shifted from listing and trying to go places to see birds all the time, my experience with birds was richer because when I stayed curious about anything, no matter what it was in front of me, I was open to much more and I actually got to see and learn a lot more as well. The other piece of this I think that is interesting is that often as adults we feel like we've We've learned, we've done our learning, um, and that curiosity is for children. Um, I often get pushed to teach kids. Why aren't you teaching kids more? You should go teach kids. You should go to school. And I'm like, well, I think there's plenty of adults out there that need a little bit of reconnection with that curiosity, that childlike curiosity, um, reawakening their senses. So I think I'm going to stay right there. And this kind of ties into this mindful birding and mindfulness. And, and this was the piece that, that I've struggled with in my own self-care is in thinking about, oh, I should be doing yoga. I should be, you know, meditating would probably help all of those different things. But it, those things really didn't work for me. I couldn't turn meditation into a practice, but I could turn the way that I birded into a mindful experience. And what I was getting out of it were those same things that you can get out of meditation, concentration, connectivity, um, and a reduction in stress and anxiety as well. So when I think of mindful birding, I think of it as being in the moment with whatever bird is there. So if it's a starling, great. If it's a house sparrow, great. 
It also means that I have to do a lot of letting go, um, letting go of the expectation of what I want to see or what I should see in that season or what I should see for where I'm going. Um, naming and knowing the bird. So, oh my gosh, I have to get long enough looks so I know what this is. Can I shut off that part of my brain and just experience the bird without having to, to name it and know what it is? And letting go of the list. This is a really hard one. Like part of me wants to still be the scientist and make sure I upload my eBird list so I'm doing good things for science. And the other part of me just wants to let that go. And the third thing, is relaxing and breathing. There are times when I catch myself clenching my binoculars for dear life to make sure I see that bird, right? And I'm like, okay, Bridget, like in this moment, we're gonna relax and we're gonna take a couple deep breaths and we're gonna let go of things and just kind of be here in this place. Claire Thompson, this piece of mindfulness comes for her book, um, she's English. Um, she wrote a great little short, beautiful book called The Art of Mindful Bird Watching. And she said, mindfulness is paying attention on purpose without judging and with kind acceptance to our thoughts, feelings, bodily sensations, and she incurs, incur, includes and our surrounding environment. So for me, all of this really changed um, and shifted. Um, over time, I really didn't like how I was birding or how the birding community was telling me to bird. I wanted to be able to experience other things other than just listing and identifying things. Um, my experience and my practice changed when I became a mom as well, and my time was limited, and I couldn't go on bird trips, and I couldn't go and see different and unique birds. And this is where slow birding developed for me. It was really about shifting from chasing birds and listing birds to really getting to know birds on a deeper level and connecting with them. The first time I ever did a sit spot, um, I was in Maine and we sat as part of a bird language course for 45 minutes on the edge of a coastal salt marsh in Maine. And I had my notebook like I do here in this picture. And we were just told to notice things. Take notes if you want to and draw pictures if you want to, that's fine too. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna notice behaviors. I'm gonna get this down and I'm gonna get to get that down. And that was probably the first 10 minutes. And then everything started to settle and I relaxed into the ground that I was sitting on and I smelled the marsh, all those senses opened right up. And when I got off of the marsh and we walked back, I broke down in tears because it was the first time that I had spent 45 minutes in a quiet place. And the only thing I had to do was just be there and notice things. it changed my birding practice forever, for sure. And so I, I see the power in this and I see the gift that birds have to give to us and they're there every day. Every day they are there. So I wanna give you a couple tips to be able to do that for yourself. So here's what I think about. These are my five little tips. And I do talk about these in my slow birding classes. Um, but these are ones that you can try right away this weekend. One is just to make the time. I try to sit every morning by the window, like, I, like you saw in that picture, or at least step outside every day for 10 minutes. It used to be 20 minutes. Now I'm down to 10 because because I got three kids and I'm trying to homeschool them right now. So my time is a little bit shorter. They do this with me too, which is great. Try the sit spot method. That means you don't go anywhere. You pick a spot close to home, someplace that you can access easily. It can be inside. And when the weather gets better, we can push it outside. But try and sit in one place, go back to that spot over and over again and see what comes to you. 
stay in your senses. So I always start by taking a deep breath and really feeling everything all the way down into the earth and then trying to listen in all the directions I can. And I might start to take some notes and maybe draw some pictures. I'm a terrible nature journal person, but I still draw stuff because it's just for me. It's just for me. And then I share stories and I connect with others. I have this great thread with two other female burners that I love that we just kind of ping stuff back and forth with each other. And we have all during the pandemic, even though we haven't been able to get together. And that's been really special to share those awesome, awesome stories with others. All right, I'm gonna leave you with one final quote. So this is from a book called Birds Art Life, A Year of Observation by Kaya McClear. She's an artist and she had another artist friend who was gonna go and start bird watching. And she was like, why do you wanna do that? That's just weird. And so she went and did it with him. And then she ended up writing a whole book because they explored all these different things together through their experiences and their art with birds. She says, now when I hear bird song, I feel an entry to that understory. When I'm feeling too squeezed on the ground, exhausted by everything in my care, I look for a little sky. There are always birds flying back and forth, city birds flitting around our human edges, singing their songs. So I hope I've given you a couple of things to grasp and take with you. Um, some knowledge that your birding practice is good for you, is healthy for you, that you can tweak it in little ways here and there to make it even more so. These are the three books that, um, that are the books that really got me going thinking about this on a deeper level. The Nature Fix by Florence Williams um, is really of all, it's called Why Nature Makes Us Happier, Healthier, and More Creative. Um, Zen Birding is an amazing short read um, by David White. He was a head of an Audubon Society in the Southern United States and actually started writing this book as he was going through cancer treatments. He was unable to finish the book, but his wife did for him from his journals. Just amazing. And then the third one is The Art of Mindful Bird Watching by Claire Thompson. And she's pretty incredible too. She has a whole series of books pardon me, on mindfulness in nature. We do have time for questions. I'm gonna throw this up here so that you see it. You know that you can reach me at any time. I'm at birddiva.com. I'm at birddiva at gmail.com. I love hearing your stories. I love answering those questions that you're wondering about and trying to tease apart. And I am on multiple platforms on social media as well. So you can tap into some of my stories and the slow burning community that I have been cultivating online as well. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we can get to some questions. Great, yeah, I think we'll go, we'll try to go a little over if folks are okay, just till about 8.10 to allow people time for questions, if that's okay with everybody. Um, and um, I can help monitor the chat. If, uh, if I call your name, you can unmute and ask your question if you like. So if you say you have a question, just put it in the chat and I'll call your name. If, that way we can go in an orderly fashion. I do know Victoria had a question for you, Bridget, earlier in the presentation. She was curious because um, you have a focus on trying to make sure that female birds get um, noticed and identified just as much as male birds. And she was wondering in your slides, especially that first one where we stopped to identify them, um, if the if any of them were female or which ones were male. Um, so I didn't know if you wanted to go back and, and look at those. Yeah, you... honestly, I think most of those birds were male when it comes right down to it. Uh, however, I will let you know that of the two talks I am premiering this year, this is one of them. The other one is going to be in, uh, I think it's the end of May or it's the end of April. It's on my website. It's with the uh, Grafton Nature Museum and it's called Ladies Only. And it's gonna be all about 
uh, the science of female bird song and the mothers of ornithology. So it's something, another topic that I've become really passionate about thinking about how our um, biases have kind of allowed us to overlook some female scientists, some awesome female scientists, and to just, we, we haven't been asking the same kind of questions. Um, we have different perspectives, males and females. And so um, we ask things differently. There are some great um, studies coming out about female birdsong that I'm excited to share with folks too. So that's coming. Great. Thank you. Um, I think Tom, you had a comment or question if you want to ask it. Yes, I was watching a um, documentary uh, in the movie, in a film series, sort of the David Attenborough thing. I think it was called The Secret Life of Trees. But they made a point that in Japan, if I've got this right, people would do uh, tree baths. And it would mean going into the forest and staying there for a while because apparently the trees are putting out a certain number of various kinds of ions and chemicals that are helpful to you. It's, so it's, it's a literally a biological thing, not merely a spiritual thing. Yes, exactly. So um, that Nature Fix book, and I've got it right here uh, by... Florence Williams. So she has a whole chapter on this. So she traveled, she actually traveled all over the world and met with different scientists. And she did go to Japan to look at uh, the practice of, I think it's called Shinrin Yoku. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but it is, it's the forest bathing. And she talks to scientists about the aerosols that different plants and trees mm -hmm and habitats give off and how they are received in our bodies. It's mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, sorry, Bridget, I wasn't quite um, paying attention. We were talking about your events, but Victoria had a question about your slow birding events and how they work. So I wasn't sure if you had answered that in your um, uh, question from before. No, so uh, let's see. So slow, slow burning. My slow burning programs are happening in a number of different ways right now because of the pandemic. So I have shifted to a lot of online courses. The next online course for slow burning is in March, and it's a four week course. You get um, videos each week and some challenges to do. It helps you shift and develop a sit spot practice and also change the way that you look and listen to birds and kind of pushes away from that drive to, um, to list and identify. So it's really about developing a deeper connection with birds, especially ones that are most common around you. Uh, as we get into the place, uh, hopefully out of, I won't say out of the pandemic, but in a better place as the, the vaccines become more available, there are other organizations that are queued up to host slow burning weekends. So pre-pandemic, I was hosting overnight weekends as well. So um, it's possible that those are coming back. We did successfully hold a small group social distanced slow birding weekend, not an overnight, um, but two day session uh, with the North Branch Nature Center. So I, I'll be back again there this year doing that same thing. So I, I'm hoping to be able to be back with people soon. Um, it'll just, it'll be COVID safe until we're all vaccinated and healthy and can be birding shoulder to shoulder again. Yeah, that'll be a lovely time. Um, okay, I'm just looking at the chat here. Jan was just asking for the um, title of the book, Then Birding Again. Oh, it was she put Freya, put Freya it you're on it. Thank you. Yep. Um, and the Nature Center again, so North Branch Nature Center is in Montpelier, Vermont. You can find all these things on my website. So if you go to birddiva.com, all of, all of these things are there and will be there very soon. Um, you can also uh, sign up for an e my email list, which I don't send out very often. It's, it tends to be once a month or almost seasonally just so that people can keep up with what's been updated on the calendar. Yay, good. <laughs> Sam, I'm glad your cat had a blast. 
I, you know, my, my bird programs do very well, the ones especially with audio with cats. They're popular with pets too. So that's, that's pretty good. I should probably put that on my website. <laughs> uh, Victoria has a question here. Um, oh, birds and brews events, yeah. Oh my gosh, the birds and brews. So, oh, Victoria, and you could tell me, maybe you can send me an email privately. I'm on the fence. I think I'm taking January off, but I am getting emails from people. This is an event that I used to hold once a month. Uh, pre pandemic, we actually met at a brewery hung out, talked. There were like little games that we would play to engage conversation and then it moved online. Um, I'm trying to figure out a way to keep that going. But uh, yeah, I think right now, January is just a blur. Uh, so maybe February again, we'll see if we can get it going online again. Yeah. Um, okay, we just have a few more minutes left. Does anybody else have any questions about um, some material Bridget share with us today, birding wellness, birding stories they want to share. Um, we have um, recorded the session, so um, sometime next week um, I will um, just send the recording to the list. So uh, this way if you didn't catch some things you can, you can rewatch it. Um, but thank you all so much for coming tonight. Oh, Jan has something, oh, looks like just a, a comment. Thanks, Jan. Um, this was really great, Bridget. I really appreciate it. I've learned so much um, from great. you already, and this was just great. The curiosity piece was really <laughs> like my like heart for tonight. Like that's just like, it's so true. When you're curious, you're at your most, e you know, at mm. ease and like you really just want to dive into the world. So that's just, that's really great. So really thank you so much. And y'all, if you have any questions, um, for Bridget, you know where to find her and you know where to find me if you have questions about another foundation and farm room wilderness. And we hope to see you at the next um, event, which is in February with uh, Vermont Institute of Natural Science. So um, thanks again, everyone. And I'm gonna end the meeting. Thank you all. Thanks for all the beautiful stories in the chat box too. I'm just noticing them. Oh, Kelly, they're so great. I know. It's so cool. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, Thank you. Thank you, lots of fun, thank you.